good evening and welcome to the Super Lessons F1 podcast. My name is Rodney. And my name is Zach. And welcome to Super Lessons, the, the official podcast of punching George Russell right in his face. <laughs> I can't believe we went there so early. Oh, the lad. Every time I see it now, I, I just think, there he is with his... He's got... You know, I was, I was thinking about this, Rod. He has a bit of Mark Zuckerberg okay. face about him. They're kind of like, are you oh, a robot? Your skin's so smooth. He's are you that, an automaton? Maybe yeah. that's it. It's got a touch of the droids about him. Touch of the droids. Um, vanilla droid. I wanted to get it in early because if you didn't listen to the Dare to Swear episode, and there's also a chance, like, if George Russell listened to that episode, he might have listened to the first five minutes and then been like, oh, I've got stuff to do, uh, and skipped out. But I wanted to make sure if he heard this one that he wouldn't miss out. But obviously, this is the, the F1 podcast that we do, which is where we talk about all kinds of stories, uh, all kinds of weird, different things, and uh, it's going to be a good time. We've got a little bit of stuff to cover because there's been a few races since the last time we spoke yeah, it's been a of the Super Quiz. The return of the yeah. super quiz. Oh, a fucking super quiz. Yes. When, I, when you sent me a message and said, hey, by the way, mate, could I uh, surprise a little super quiz for you? <laughs> Got one in the bag. I was like, oh, what a day this is going to be. What a recording day. What? And you know what? You didn't say happy to speak to me this week you, like you usually do in the intro, but I know you are. And I'm happy to speak to you too because we've got lots of fun things to cover. I feel like you I haven't been it. talking Formula One in a while, but more recently, this is a new thing mm-hmm. that's been happening to me. People message me. Pre-race mm, now, okay. and people, you know who you are, because I appreciate it, and they go, you know, a friend of mine, Jack, goes, what should I be looking out for? And I think that is a brilliant question. What yep. should I be looking out for this race? Um, so maybe in future, we'll, I'll, we'll introduce that at the end of the show to preview the next race or something like that, or the next little period. What should we be looking out for? Um, but I appreciate all of the newly engaged Formula One fans in my life, um, and that's why I've been itching to talk to you, because you're the most engaged. I would say that we're engaged in a Formula One kind of marriage. Um, <laughs> yes, which is what this podcast that far. is. Yeah, it's true. Oh, I like that. I think look forward to this in the next month or so would be a good uh, way to sign off and wrap things up. Um, but yeah. we're going to start off with a couple of quick stories before we get into some of the meat that's on this bone. The first thing we're going to look at is these tweaks to the qualifying format. And I'll tell you, when I see that grouping of words, I just feel some kind of way and I, it's not usually good. Um, have you got an overall sense of what these changes are and your feelings? It's all tires. We're always talking about, we want to cut down the amount of resources being used by Formula yeah. One. They want to, Formula One wants to reduce down the amount of tires being used in, uh, in the qualifying stages because whilst they get an allocation for the whole weekend, um, teams are using like fresh ones every stage. So they'd like, uh, they'd be forced to use the hard tire in Q1, medium in yeah. Q2 and soft tire in q3 so the sessions just get faster and faster and faster that's going to be tricky i think for some teams because they're like well we've just done all these practice sessions and we know where (laughs) our car is actually fastest and it's not on the hard tires we struggle to turn them on and whereas that team actually does really well so it just adds for me rod if you're going to ask me i think this is a little bit dumb what do you think (laughs) I don't mind the idea of having different tires for different sessions. At least, I mean, it's very confusing right now that you would qualify on whatever the whatever tire you set your fastest lap on in Q2. That's the tire you start the race on. I'm like, what? So I think that's really confusing and we can do a bit better. I feel like though, um, yeah, I think you're right that it will advantage teams that can turn on the tires, especially in, say, Q1, if you're... If you're a Haas and you can't get the hard tire, you know, up to up to temp and working, but if you're another team like Williams and you can, I mean, then you then you're in a Q2, and that's a huge difference. That's a few that's a few uh, grid slots. So yeah, there's that. I don't know. I just I keep feeling like people have got one eye on qualifying. Like mm, that's where all the gold is in terms of changes. I'm like, but that's the only bit that's actually pretty good. So I just wish they'd leave it alone. Yeah, it's been pretty consistent for a while now. I think we all know how it works. It seems to work pretty well at getting us a grid that makes sense. Something for teams to you know celebrate as well. I think there's in it for all fans of all drivers and teams. Have been like, oh look, you know, Albon made it to Q three. Like that's amazing. What a what an outstanding performance. Like I think there's it's a nice format as it is. I've I've grown to love it, um, or at least like it. At least feel warm towards it. Maybe not enough for me to be like, unlike the sprint races where I'm like, oh, I'm actually going to definitely tune in for that qualifying. Like if I'm not going to go out of my way to be at home at 2 p.m. on Saturday to catch qualifying. But it does make for a good highlights reel as well. Um, Because, yeah, you can kind of dent it down into like three minutes of video from an hour of of qualifying. So, yeah, 
don't no, we don't need more weird tire complications that kind of get in the way of what we all are trying to do in qualifying which is just like find the order of who is fastest over one lap i think this adds a level of complication that we just don't need Hmm. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. Mm. We've had, uh, we're going to get to the Miami Grand Prix recently, but that was one of the more recent, not just races, but recent uh, additions geographically to the Formula One mm. grid. But coming up very soon will be the Las Vegas Grand Prix. So you're obviously wondering where are they going to be racing and how on earth are they going to fit an F1 race onto the Las Vegas Strip? Well, the answer is quite simple, Zach. Formula One's just friggin' bought the town, basically. They said uh, they'd just gone like, look, we can use the street. The street's already there. Why are we building a street? There's a street here, for heaven's sake. But uh, the problem is they need to fit all of the garages and, and uh, the paddock and the facilities and stuff. So uh, to avoid the drivers having to get changed around the roulette table, uh, what they've actually done is they've actually bought a big block of land and they're going to be building facilities on there. I love that form. I love any sport where you just roll into town and you're like, Nice city you got here. I'll buy it. You know what I mean? It's very Las Vegas vibes. <laughs> I think this is good, though, because, you know, one of my favorite races on the calendar, the Singapore Grand Prix, has that feel of being like you're in the main interesting part of town and there's also a Formula One race on. I think that that would be a good like schema for Las Vegas to try to copy. It's like, look, it's this great part of town. We're just going to plonk an F1 race in here. And if you can also like, get all the facilities in and kind of have one eye on that, ongoing it'll also guarantee that uh we'll keep racing in las vegas and that's where a lot of the races that are new to the calendar have kind of struggled is to kind of be sticky and liberty media themselves investing in this race um is is good i think uh, but it is great they can just be like well here's 240 mil just to buy those spaces i i often wonder <laughs> and, and you know this is no accusations on anyone's part i sometimes wonder if you know, whoever owned those spaces before was like, mm, you're a mate, I'm a mate, let's just uh, let's, let's clean some money through this situation mm. and just uh, this, this is how much it costs because that's how much I would like to be paid. Um, so good on them. Should be sticky. Uh, as you mentioned, that'll be, what, three races in the US next year or whenever mm-hmm. Las Vegas starts next year, right? So I can't imagine they're all just going to be called the US Grand Prix because even this last weekend um, in Miami, that was the – that. Like, if you look at the schedule, that's the United States Grand Prix, but it's actually the Miami Grand Prix, brought to you by Crypto.com. Um, <laughs> oh, dear. And then the U.S. Well, – we've also got the U.S. Grand Prix later, which is the United States Grand Prix 2022, um, without mention of of uh, of Austin. So it's interesting how we're going to continually name these races. I mean, we have two Italian races. We, you know, we, we've previously had multiple races in, multiple, in, in the same country. But when you get towards three – like, are we going to put them all together? Do we spread them out over the season? It's, it's greedy. It's greedy, America. Let the greedy. rest of us have some races. Look, I've, been, I've, I've, I've watched one or two American things on TV, and I'm here to tell you, mate, greedy's good. I've heard, I think it was, I think it was, was it, was it Churchill that said that? I think someone said that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, look, I mean, Speaking the FAA won't be, yes, the FAA won't be short of cash because they're, they're throwing out fines left, right, and center or trying to to all the drivers for wearing jewelry of all things. Jewelry. Um, I mean, these are rich guys. What are they meant to do with all their money? But it's, yeah, I mean, there's a few obvious cases. This is being pretty well documented. Lewis Hamilton doesn't want to take his jewelry out. Kevin Magnussen doesn't want to take his wedding ring off. There's also a a clampdown on official underwear. So they're saying, hey, uh, these are in the regulations. You can't wear jewelry, must wear uh, certified, you know, safety underwear. And uh, to the jest of the drivers who, who have not taken kindly to those uh, instructions and they've been mm. they've been informed it's in the regulations we're going to be checking to which lewis hamilton has responded come check it come and if you think i can remove it you come remove it give it your best shot yeah. this thing is welded on and it's going nowhere so i think mm, this, is gonna, this is gonna be an interesting one i think that there's a bit of resistance from the drivers who are like look we're all for safety this is not a safety issue it's just not I don't know that they're necessarily the ones I want making that call, but uh, that's the way it seems to be. You got any hot takes to start off? I got I got three three big hot takes. Yeah, give me all. The three. First one is the first one is uh, I think this is a classic case of FIA, FIA versus Formula One because Formula One needs people wearing jewelry and branded merch and all that kind of stuff to attract sponsors. Like that's the whole purpose of Liberty Media owning Formula One is to get the money in. So more sponsors, the better. And teams need to be able to feel, 
you know, really secure. We've got Lewis Hamilton wearing three different watches, you know, one's from IWC, one's from Mercedes, and I can't tell what the other one is, but that's like important to brand (laughs) and important to Mercedes and Lewis Hamilton as a driver. And so if you've got sponsored stuff you need to wear, and it happens to be jewelry, and we're talking about um, one of Formula One's biggest sponsors, Rolex, any green Mm. part of of the track is always covered in Rolex branding. I'm sure they're a bit like, I don't know how we feel about this. And, you know, I actually spoke to Michael Lambert uh, a long time ago um, yes. about the idea of is the FIA the main, like, sticking point for Formula One moving forward? Like, because, like, what are they for? Yes, it's an FIA class world championship, but I don't know if every, the average day, the average punter is like, oh, wouldn't watch this Formula One if it wasn't, like, uh, officially earmarked by the FIA as the world championship. I, I don't think that would matter. I think Formula One could just move away from that. And stuff like this, eh, it's, I, I don't think it matters too much. Safety is important, but I don't, like, it's just, it seems nitpicky. Second thing of, of my hot takes, uh, no, so the first thing was the branding and the sponsorship. Second was FIA versus Formula One. The, oh, did I have a third one? Oh. You said you had three. I thought you had these lined yeah. up. Are you reading off notes? Yeah, I did. I did. I did. I did. I did. Yeah. yeah. Check the back yeah, of your I, hand. Did I, you write I think it down there? The third one is um, the quote from Magnuson that's like, oh, mm. I think it, you know, the, forcing us to remove symbolic items makes me feel a bit uncomfortable. You know, um, I don't know. I, I think, all right, Formula One divas, I think you can give that up a little <laughs> bit, though. Like, yes, it means a lot to you, but where do you draw the line there? Like being made to take things off, like whilst you're in the car. Other sports have this too, you know. Every, uh, like, football player before they get subbed on gets checked by a referee of like, hey, you're not wearing any uh, got any piercings there. They could just get, like, randomly yep. torn off. Anything no like secret that. So, football stuffed yeah. up your jersey that you're sneaking <laughs> onto the pitch. No, none of that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Kevin, I see you've hidden some extra kilometre speed per hour <laughs> in that wedding ring. Um, you can't take that into the car with you. So, yeah, they're my three hot takes. What do you think? More jewellery or less, Rod? Oh, I mean, the regulation says you can't wear it in the car. I, I, it doesn't say you can't wear it in, in the grid. It doesn't say you can't wear it, you know, to the press conference. It just says you can't wear it while you're competing in the car. I think that's completely reasonable. But the other thing I wanted yeah. to, to pose is this, a thought experiment, if you will. So Lewis Hamilton, Ooh. obviously uh, they said, Lewis, uh, you have to take all your jewelry out. He was like, yeah, as if I can do that. And, uh, you know, people identified he wears a, a nose stud ring. It does seem like he wears... Uh, one while he's been in the car, I can imagine him pulling off the off the helmet, having that already in. That's fine. But uh, there was some forensic uh, evidence put out there because he did drop a comment, and this, you know, you have to take it all with a grain of salt. Who knows what he's joking about? But he did say, mm-hmm. "I've got at least two piercings in very personal spots that oh. I can't tell you about that can't be removed." And there was some forensic examination of. I don't know if you've ever scrolled through his Instagram feed, but he doesn't leave a lot to the imagination most of the time. So. Ipso facto, he has them in those bits. Now, put yourself in the shoes of the FIA delegate that has to go down to the Mercedes garage, and they're like, Lewis, are you wearing any jewellery? And he's like, no, wink. And you're like, I, I don't know if you noticed this, but you <laughs> just winked at me. Why did you say wink? <laughs> he's like, oh, I'm definitely not wearing any. And they're like, well, you have to, I have to search you. I'm sorry. And he goes, okay. And he drops his trousers, and you look down, and, and there it is. And Christian Horner's looking over your shoulder, kind of nodding, going, yep. And then you have to look Lewis in the eye and go, well, like, what do you say? What do you say to him? You can see it. It's right there. It's right in front of you. But what do you say? Yeah. I say, yeah, I mean, I don't know. This do you say, is like, what's because... between you and me? Like, let's not tell anyone about this and just move on with our lives? Or do you say, look, I'm sorry, a uh, huge fine for you, or you're out of the race? Yeah, just kick him out of the race, I say. Just get him out. Mm. No, the, the fines don't work because they, the individual drivers can afford them. But also, if you make them too insane, like they're two hundred and sixty-five thousand dollars for wearing a watch or something, it's like a some watches are worth more than that. Um, yeah. they, they, they seem incredibly insane for small little infractions. I don't know. Well, don't it's do tricky. it. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. No, you're right. You're right. You're right. I mean, what I want to know, Rod, is that uh, Hamilton's piercings in those mm-hmm. areas. Do you think he gets the engineering team at Mercedes to? You work out the best materials, how aerodynamic they are. I can't imagine he's using <laughs> platinum or something, like a, a one of the denser materials. Do you think they're carbon fiber? Do you think they're He did like say titanium? what one of them was. He said it wasn't magnetic, but again, that's not really mm. the point. I mean, it wasn't that long ago, just over a year ago, that one of the drivers had to walk through fire to save his life. I can imagine mm. if he had some nipple rings in and it's like, oh, no, you got out okay, except what? why is all that wrapping around your chest? 
Oh, no reason. Uh, the, the fires, <laughs> the fires from uh, you know Formula One fuel can't burn, can't, uh, can't melt yeah, steel beams, right? Can't but, you know, melt nipple God. steel. Of course, everybody yeah. knows that. <laughs> well, look, what a high note for us to continue on. So that's enough for the quickie section, but I do have a quick... We're going we're gonna to quickly touch base in the So True corner. So this is Ooh. So True, where we point out things that we've noticed. People say, where we go, boy, that's So True. I've got one, uh, and uh, I'm still definitely waiting. I know everyone's sitting on like hundreds of them. They're going to send them <laughs> via email to superlicensepodcast at gmail.com. But the one that I heard was at Imola. This is Christian Horner. Uh and he said that getting one two in MLR was one of their best ever results, which Christian Horner, that is just so true in a sport where there's two drivers. To get one two, it's just so true. That's the best result you can get. Um, I don't know if you had anything that you wanted to contribute. Nothing on the so true front. No. I think they were I think they've kind of picked up their game recently. I do have one radio comment. This was from Emily. Oh, yes. Um Brilliant. where Ted Kravitz literally said, Oh, there's been a massive crash. Oh, nothing's happened. Um, <laughs> it just it seemed to go really fast that there was it was just so good. it was it was just like on um uh, unsafe release in front of him oh, yes. and you know how sometimes you get the unsafe mm. relief and I mean, they just go thought... two by two they just go next to each other down yeah, the lane they just, it's but Kravitz out. had called it as a giant crash before it, it, like, oh, before anything happened he's like oh there's been a massive crash oh nothing's fine it's all fine actually don't worry Boy, about it um, it's all good the race in um, his mind on that day was better than any race that we saw Oh, yeah, exactly. He's. I think he's bringing things into existence by imagining them. He thinks he knows how things are going to turn out, but they don't. Yes, Look, we're Kravitz stands true. here. I'm not going to. It's true. I'm not going to push push Kravitz um, in front of I, the uh, unsafe release of Ocon uh, or bus, <laughs> I suppose. <And> so, <laughs> it's all good. Um, I do have one more thing that's outside of the realm of so true, but it's inside mm. that other realm that I called out last time, which was oh, whoops, you went and wrote up a joke as if it was news. I've got a story here that John Noble wrote for Motorsport.com. Hamilton says the Miami F1 circuit is like driving in a BNQ car park in a cart because it reminded him of one corner that he used to drive mm. in his karting days. John, that was a joke. You wrote it up as if it was news. So well done. <laughs> well done to you. Um, so please do feel free if you see anything in that in that whole world in that whole realm uh, feel free to send it through you can tweet us you can you can whisper it in my ear at the bus stop if you want or uh, send us an email probably superlicensepodcast at gmail.com that's it I can't wait to hear some more so trues um, so true should we should we <laughs> true uh, <laughs> things <laughs> so dumb I'm sorry. I, thought, I wasn't sure if you were still laughing or not. I was waiting for the like the, but it wasn't that funny. Um, how have things been going, Rod? We've had a couple of races. There's been couple. some twisting and some turning. I think where we mm. where we last left off, the previously on Formula One, yes, previously on license FM, we were things were looking pretty good for Ferrari. Le Charles Leclerc was just like, you know, I'm just going to win every race, and Verstappen was like, look, <laughs> I'm going to try and finish some races actually, and then we'll see who's really fast. And it turns out. They're both still really fast, but Max mm. Verstappen uh, has really put his stamp on uh, a couple of races. Imola, he took all the points, maximum points. He got the sprint race points. <laughs> he got the fastest lap. He got the race win. But he, he maximized his weekend, as only he can, um, pun intended, and is now, you know, he, if not for those couple of um, DNFs or, or rough race weekends, he would easily be winning this championship. So do you feel like... How's your how's your feeling where things are at right now from the from a driver's perspective? Yeah, no, my feeling after the first few races was uh, if Leclerc can match Verstappen most weekends, and then a little bit of reliability goes his way, and you know against Verstappen, obviously, and there'll be some races where he dominates. So it's looking good for Leclerc. Then I thought, oh, after two more races, two more wins for Verstappen, it's suddenly looking really, really good for him. Any race uh, where he doesn't have reliability problems, he's probably going to be uh, dominating as well. So uh, that all goes very well for him. They just need to get on top of the reliability problems. They're not on top of them fully yet. And I think one of the best uh, notes that I heard recently about this whole situation is the role that the second drivers are going to play, stealing points mm. off the off the guys at the front, if it is going to be this close. Um, my gut feeling is it's either going to be like Leclerc and, and Verstappen all the way through the season. But the other possibility is a Verstappen whitewash where he just, it's a runaway championship for him and he wins it with 10 races to go. Yeah, I think the second driver's point is a really good one because up until now, Sainz has had kind of rotten luck and even at Imola, you know, got Ricardo up his up his backside, up the Jaxi. Um, <laughs> up the Jaxi. Yeah, that was up the Jaxi. That was a little, that was a little uh, uncomfortable, especially at a home race, essentially, for Ferrari. Um, 
and your know, science is pretty good. And all signs point to him making, you know, he's quick enough, um, but it has felt like Verstappen and Leclerc are kind of in their own class right now. But I think as things calm down a little bit, you know, the upgrades start to maybe not, the upgrades to the cars don't necessarily create such big distances kind of weekend to weekend. And as reliability gets a little bit better, I think we'll see signs starting to maybe put a little bit more pressure on the front. And it will be interesting if we can have a genuine, you know, three or four different drivers at the front, as Mm. opposed to just Leclerc and Verstappen, because we're going to need it in order to keep this, uh, this championship really exciting. Um, and I think Sainz probably has it in him to take a pole every now and again, you know, win a race every now and again. And if, if Ferrari, I think are probably in my mind, the more likely to pull in kind of the two drivers on the podium, I know it didn't, it's not always turning out that way, but if they can kind of consistently make that work, um, I think Perez is firmly like I am number two driver. I will sacrifice everything to try to make sure this, this happen wins. But I think if Ferrari can just continue to be like, well, we just want to get both drivers on the podium every single week, that might all go better for them. They've kind of got two horses in the race a little bit, um, two prancing horses as the case may be. Two prancing horses. Um, I think this is yeah. also uh, the reliability f- story feeds into that because it, it, it doesn't need like, like Verstappen can be affected even if reliability hits Perez's car, because then that's points that, that, you know, he, like he's not there to interfere with the other two strategically or uh, to steal points away from Leclerc or, or, or even signs. And yeah, the, 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 the reliability cloud that's hanging over Red Bull a little bit uh, doesn't need to affect his car for it to still uh, make a difference. The other thing I was going to say, and I, I mean, in the middle of a show is not the best time to do a plug, but I was I was talking to Michael Lemonado, speak of the man on Box and Neutrals <laughs> for this week, and he brought up the the the, the boss break of like, what if Mercedes bring an upgrade and suddenly they start winning races? Which is, I feel like we're quite a distance away from that right now, but I guess it's a possibility that they might come in and start winning a few. So as much as I feel like Verstappen's on the trajectory to potentially. Uh, either do it easily or at least do it comfortably. Uh, he needs to get it done soon, just in case Mercedes do come good. Because if they start mucking around, uh, Verstappen wants to make sure he's in front before that happens. It'll be interesting to see where Mercedes feel like the upgrades should be made, because it's no doubt that Red Bull right now have are just incredibly quick in a straight line, even with DRS, like they. He, Verstappen was kind of uncatchable this weekend, um, mm. so maybe DRS was powerful enough. Or, but you know, it's it's generally well understood that they're kind of almost ten kilometers an hour faster top speed against the Ferrari. Whereas that that had traditionally been Mercedes' number one thing, right? Is when they're in front, they are incredibly incredibly fast. So they're not in front right now. I wonder if they're putting the effort into yeah, a stronger power unit and getting more out of the kind of straight line speed. And if that is the case, then it might become uh, maybe by the time we get to, you know, in a few races time to some of the quicker circuits with longer straights like Canada, um, even looking at France, Austria is kind of sweeping long straights. Um, they could start to kind of push a little bit harder there. And I think it's all about being, um, like the cat amongst the pigeons a little bit. They might not necessarily be able to win races, but if it's enough, I think the best racing you get is when you know, teams like Ferrari and Ripple are having to make decisions in their strategy and their pit stop strategy, especially to accommodate more than just like the guy that's behind them or directly in front of them. They have to be like, Oh shit, we're going to have to cover off fucking punch face Russell as well. You know, <laughs> we can't like, he's pushing, he's on a different strategy to us or he's on a weird tire that we didn't back or he's one stopping when we were going to two stop. You know, it just creates more intrigue and you get more interesting battling, overtaking, kind of further down the field as well. And it disrupts enough of, of, of the front runners, I think, for the last kind of like, just like six or seven seasons. It's basically been like, oh, there goes the guy who's going to win the race. He's off at the start. And maybe with the other guy who's almost as good, we'll catch him at some point over the next two hours. Um, you know, barring any safety cars or like massive pit stop fuck ups. And that always felt like the racing wasn't necessarily settling who's winning. Whereas this season, we've had really good battling from Leclerc and Verstappen. Even this weekend, you know, Verstappen had to make the overtake to make it stick, but we didn't really see much from them after that. If Mercedes, and I'm looking at McLaren as well, because, you know, whatever kind of upgrades Mercedes bring to the PU, McLaren and the other Mercedes uh, powered teams will start to feel those, those positives as well. 
I really, really, really hope that we're, we're not just stuck in just for a Leclerc Verstappen battle because that might be for like the next 10 years as well. So uh, <laughs> yeah, the more true. we can kind of eke out of, of more challenges, uh, the better early. And I think, I think science still has a big, big role to play. We've got Spain next, uh, as far as the races go. Who will be the king of Spain? I don't think it's going to be Alonso. Whilst he's been putting together a good, you know, good, good races, you know, every weekend, it's, it feels. Um, maybe science, maybe this is his weekend. We shall see. Boy, yeah. I mean, I feel like he needs to get it done in qualifying, doesn't he? He's never been a terrific qualifier, I would say. Like, never really dominated no, his agree. teammate in qualifying in that sense. So I think that's his key to beating Leclerc. Uh, if if he, It seems like Leclerc has the edge in qualifying and just sort of pulls away um, during the races. And from then on, Carlos just has limited ability to make any difference. You also mentioned just back then before... Um, old mate George Russell's punchable face. And I, I had a bit of a flash and I was listening, definitely listening to you, but also at the same time, Googling Jude Law from the movie AI and just thinking, boy, that's mm. maybe this is the, I've unlocked something. don't know what it is exactly, mm. but I've unlocked something here that uh, there's a bit of a similarity there. Um, two right. other things from the, from the notes that I wanted to pull out though, is the performance of McLaren and uh, yeah, Russell, because obviously he's, he's been branded Mr. Fifth having been, what is he? The only driver who's finished in the top five for all the races. Like the, the British media just love to come up with any excuse to keep talking about him. Uh, he did get a bit lucky though in the last couple of races. So, uh, you gotta be I there do, though, right? You gotta be there yeah, to do gotta it. Be the guy, you gotta be the guy who's, he's giving good feedback to the team. He, he's a great racer. I think that that level of consistency is actually what Mercedes need in order to make progress. You know, they don't need him kind of like just pushing all the time to just do insanely well and take big risks. I think they just want to be consistently like, all right, cool, let's run our race. Let's try to put together some good laps. Let's try to learn about this car and you can get comfortable in it. Yeah, it's his first season at Mercedes, so he's got you know, in a totally new setup, um, totally new cars, all that kind of stuff. I know everybody's got a new car as well, but, you know, it's – they carry some stuff over generation to generation, even when the formula changes. So I think Russell can be pretty happy with his own performance. Um, and I wonder if this kind of little jump start he's had on Hamilton will kind of continue as the Mercedes improves. Um, you know, he's, he, he led, he was the fastest in practice in, uh, in Miami. And even he was a bit like, mm, I don't think it's a good indication of our like qualifying pace, but it was a good step forward. Um, and I said this kind of after the first couple of races that usually as you move through the age of a for- new formula, the team with the biggest resources starts to kind of rise up the rankings a little bit. And I think we'll start, we'll continue to see that with Mercedes. And it's just about whether Russell can be as consistent as that, as that performance change goes forward. Yeah, I think it's interesting to see. Dude, how Russell... do you think Hamilton feels with with That's Russell just say. kind of nailing it? Russell's usually uh, Hamilton's usually the one who, when the chips are down, seems to be able to deliver and just gets that luck. Gets that luck with the weather. Gets that luck with the safety car. Gets that luck with whatever, and usually inherits uh, a better a better position than his teammates. So it's funny that that luck is running to Russell. I think uh, Lewis is a bit too concerned about piercings being ripped out and all the rest of it, but just the lack of motivation of, of not being in the fight for the championship. I'm sure that it's tr- Lewis is probably struggling a little bit with that. I think in the first few races, you could just see the pressure he was putting on himself. And I thought, well, maybe when that pressure has gone, he might improve because he'll go, well, I don't have to think about that anymore. Now I can just enjoy racing again. But uh, I, I think, yeah, I think he needs a spark. And the question will be, where is he going to find that spark? Um, yeah. Russell, I mean, everything's still new. He's in the honeymoon period still, Russell, of uh, him and, and, and Papa Wolf. So, Daddy Mercedes. So, he's going to, uh, you know, he'll, he, he's still vying for, like, a podium. Please give me a podium. As opposed to Lewis, who's like, what? I'm not going to win my eighth championship? Pfft. Why do I even come yeah. to this stupid race? I wonder if they might have... You know, uh, the Silverstone, the British Grand Prix on July, th- you know, the, the first weekend of July, essentially, maybe earmarked um, as a like, cool, we want to have our ducks in a row by then. Uh, We've yeah, got our yeah, two yeah, British yeah. drivers, British based team. Let's get, let's get a really good, let's get ourselves organized for that weekend. And it could be a changeable weekend too, you know, if it rains or it's really hot or something like that, you know, they might be able to pull something out of the bag there and kind of restart their season. It's a bit finicky over the next few races with Spain, Monaco, Azerbaijan, like the kind of tracks where Monaco, nothing really happens. But by the time you get to Baku, like that, that race is usually crazy 
you know, there's always like weird crashes and safety cars and all that kind of stuff. It's a good race, but yeah, I, I think they're kind of looking down the barrel a little bit going, where are we going to find points? Like, what are we, at what point do we write this season off a little bit and start focusing on 2023? I know it's really early right now still, but at the same time we've had, what we've had one, two, three, four, five races already. Um, and whilst they've been making progress, I don't know if it's there. And speaking of it not being there, I didn't want to call out, you mentioned McLaren, um, kind of going back and forth on McLaren. Mm. Landon Norris whipped himself up a podium in Imola, but then, I mean, the other side of the garage, Jan Ricardo looks like he's never even driven a Formula One car before, let alone a new <laughs> version. He just looks all at sea. Like the, like the individual little bits of racing, he still looks like regular old Daniel, but putting together a weekend... Doesn't seem to have it. What do you think's up? Oh, they're just, they're hot, then they're cold. They're yes, then they're no. They're in, then they're out. And poor Ricardo just can't. I mean, I don't think he looks like he's never driven a car before, but he certainly can't work out how to unlock the car. I don't think it's all on him to do that, though. So the car's clearly not that great. The problem is, how come when Norris does well, Ricardo isn't doing well? That's more the question. But I guess there could be any number of factors involved in that. But for, one thing's for sure, he definitely needs some results soon. Uh, I mean, there's rumors that he like might get kicked out. I don't know that it's going to be that drastic. But he, he just for his own reputation, I think the last few years he's been a bit on the slide. All of a sudden he wins one race last year and everyone's like, yeah, that's guy. We, we remember him. We love him. The race yeah. winner, Daniel Ricciardo. Yeah. But all is not forgiven as far as I'm concerned. So... He still needs to mm. find something. Lift. He's got a lift. Um, Most experienced but, but, Australian Formula One driver now. Now, yeah. 15 starts. Crazy, so huh? Mark Webber. Crazy. Yeah. But McLaren like, needs to find something. It feels like a 25-year-old. Well, I mean, that's his, that's his personality as well. A lot feeds into that. And he'll be around for a little while, hopefully. So he's got a long way to go. Hopefully he can, you know, get some more wins. Maybe a championship, please, Daniel. But um, <laughs> no, my hope yeah, is think... Astri already. <laughs> <laughs> McLaren have got to find something. They've got to they've got to unlock whatever's not working for them. The problem is, like you say, Mercedes are sort of thinking, yeah, we're close to unlocking this thing as well. And then Williams are the other team that are like, yeah, like Alan uh, Elbon after the race was saying, like, yeah, we got ninth. Everyone might be surprised, but I'm not that surprised because we had some some practice sessions where I was like on fire. I couldn't believe it. And then all of a sudden yeah. we get to qualifying, and it's like, what is this junk car you've given me? Um, the Mercedes <laughs> boys, um, Russell was saying the same thing. So something is just up. They've, they've, they've got some, I don't know, like qualifying mode that's just not working or they, they seem to be really flipping all the switches and they suddenly flip one that's really good, but they don't know how they did it and they can't replicate it. Yeah, they don't know why they're slow or why they're fast. No. Yes, I think right. that's just totally new formula. Um, it's interesting seeing the consistency of drivers like uh magnuson for example i think he's just been used to driving like pretty crappy cars for a long time so he knows maybe how to eke out like Mm, middle of the road performances all the time um like not push it too hard but also like kind of just push it hard enough that he's a really consistent finisher i I mean alonso is like this too kind of he doesn't really wring the neck of the car as much as he's just like I will push this to the edges of its ability. Like he knows the balance between like, I know my abilities and the car can't keep up with that. Maybe this is also about being like an older driver. It's like you, the car is a bit like your own body. You're like, I know how to do all of those things, but my body physically can't do them anymore. Yeah. That's so a great the day. You wake up at that's, 30. That's such a great comparison. And I, I heard someone who mostly talks about indie car talking about F1 this week because we're in Miami and whatever, but they were like, you know, all the formula one drivers that come to indie cars say how much they love it because it's like real driving and they have to, they don't have all the assists that you get in the Formula One cars and you've got to do a bit more, you're a bit more in control, but there's a lot more to do as well. And I wonder whether Magnussen, having been in Indy car for a little bit, came back mm. to Formula One going like, this is so, like, I'm just, of course I'm going to smash this. <laughs> so this easy. is just so, <laughs> so easy. It's like going from, uh, going from 200cc in Mario Kart down to 50 and being like, yeah, see you later, suckers. Um, the other thing I noticed about Indy car is how, how much, People in the IndyCar world, just in their own minds, just love to think they could just parachute one of their own into Formula One and just that, that's just the thing that just happens. And it's like, boy, it's so much more complicated than that. Yeah, so, so different. I mean, there's been lots of chat about uh, whether Vettel will, will go do some some other motorsport no. driving as no, well. No, he won't. Uh, no, <laughs> he you don't won't. think so? No, that, I mean, not by his own choice, well. no. I mean, if they really enforce <laughs> this underwear ban and he wants to be hardcore about it, uh, maybe, yeah. but look, no, I, I, no, <laughs> no, no, no. 
No. Um, I don't know. What you, is there any more race talk or F1 on track action stuff that you want to talk about, or should we move on? No, I think we can move on. We've got a couple more stories that we want to touch on, though, or we could do a super quiz and then come back to them. Which way? Let's let's you know, let's just play it loosey goosey this week. Okay. Well, I mean, let's. I don't think these will take too long, and then we can finish on the high of the super quiz. Sweet. Um, let's finish them off. There's been some chat about changing up the well, the F1 drivers. I like mm, that sprint race. Don't know if I like it. Kind of setting the grid. That's a bit weird and doesn't sit comfortable with me. Maybe it's restricting how I go about racing that race. And there's been murmurs that they would perhaps like it to be like a standalone event. Uh, it can still be worth points, but it's like another part of the weekend. Um, I think that sounds pretty good. What do you think? Uh, no, don't like it. I okay. I, I think if you're going to do it, it's got to count for something. So I don't like the idea that it counts for virtually nothing, maybe other than some points. But no, don't, I, no, no, I want it to count. Um, one one thing that they could think about doing is, I don't even know how this would work, but maybe if you wanted to really have a condensed Formula One weekend, instead of a full race, you just have a sprint race and it's a bit longer. Maybe that. You'd have qualifying and a race on the same day, something like that, with just an hour in between, maybe. But I don't like the idea of having a full F1 race on the weekend and a separate sprint race where if you fall back to the end, if you qualify pole and then you fall back to the back, then come the next day, you just go back on pole and you're you're in the front row. Just don't really, I just don't really know. I don't really like that. And and I think it's not, it's the idea is like, I don't want to take any risks because it'll affect my race on Sunday. So therefore, if you, if you, like silo the two from each other. Therefore, I'll take more risks. I'm like, no, no. The problem is, you don't want to push because you don't want to crash and you don't want to smash into a wall. That's that's mm. the risk because then that will wipe out Sunday. Either way, it'll do that. So I just, yeah. I just don't. None, none, nothing about any of that gets me excited. Maybe it does for you. Maybe it does for a casual F1 fan. I don't know, but not me. What about race weekends where instead of having a full Formula One race, we have like three sprint races? A bit like the what the F2. Uh, and F3 do they have like a few races over the weekend but how do you differentiate them from each other to the degree that it's interesting and then you're gonna have to be like oh so we I don't know. We'll flip qualifying. the qualifying yeah exactly yeah qualifying no, and then God, sprint race sucks. and then I don't like any of that and then <laughs> flip the grid sprint race so the overall the weekend's worth like 25 points but you'll get a nice nice even distribution gives other teams an opportunity to get some points changes up the format a little bit. Maybe it works on tracks where longer races may be a little bit more boring um, because it's so repetitive and the cars kind of spread out, perhaps just like Miami was this weekend. There was just large swathes of the race where everyone was two seconds apart. So DRS does nothing. There's no catching each other, but there's also like no way you're going to be caught. Uh, But then a safety car comes in and then suddenly like the next, next 10 laps are electric. So, you know, maybe shorter formats work on some tracks and can keep the sport kind of interesting. Um, and maybe those race weekends maybe aren't as, like, taxing on the teams. You can make them a shorter race weekend as opposed to being, like, four days. You can make them just two um, because, you know, they don't need to do as much practice to get, like, long runnings in because there's no long race. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, events. the thing I know... The thing I know is that it's not popular with fans. Like, fans don't like the spent races, and the verdict is in. I mean, I was always on the fence, but the verdict is in across the board. People don't like it, so I just don't understand, like, what difference it's going to make. Like, oh, really? don't, don't make it that. set the grid. I, I haven't seen like, that. I haven't very, seen that in... Very, very, very unpopular. Really? I yeah. think they're electric. I really like them. I mean, I don't like how I, they sit in the sport, but I think as an individual element of racing, I think they're really good. Like it takes the best parts of some of the best parts, not all the best parts, but some of the best parts <laughs> of Formula One racing and puts it on a track, you know, and puts it in front of you for half an hour. I don't know. I just don't know. I think for me, it's like a chore. It's like, I just want to sit down for my two hours and watch my sport. I don't want to have to do homework. I don't want to have to feel like I've missed out if I can't watch it. I don't like that element of it. And mm. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I get it. And, and I get it. Yeah, I don't know. More, I mean, look, more people don't like them than do like them. So there's that. And we could just have a a different championship that has super exciting racing uh, with cars that are as fast as Formula One cars. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, maybe it's just totally different. Maybe it's a t- like like F2, but instead of a support race, it's F2 cars, but the Formula One drivers drive them. And if they crash, it doesn't matter. It's it's totally separate 
competition, mm. basically. It's just an extra mini competition. Don't know. Yeah. But it's, look, it's not my don't job know. to fix it. You know what? You know, there's been a big dunno. Cloud, uh, like a, a big Deneau cloud over Formula One lurking on the horizon for like the last 10 years uh, and for the mm. entire time we've been doing this podcast. But the clouds are parted and the truth has come out that Porsche and Audi, which are both Volkswagen Group companies uh, who have long racing histories, are like, yep, we're going to join uh, Formula One in 2026. In fact, they their CEO has said like 2026 is the last opportunity really for another 10 years because the the rules are going to change again. Formula is essentially changing again. Uh, and if we don't get in, then we don't really see how we would ever do it. I thought there was some really interesting points in this interview that he gave. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was an interview with Autosport. Um, mm-hmm. uh, he said, no, in a YouTube video addressing questions of the residents of Volkswagen, Wolfsburg city. Um, and he said two things that really that down at me. The first one was, it's the rise in popularity of Formula One. It's the reason why they're coming into it because, and especially name, name checks, the Netflix series, Drive mm-hmm. to Survive, or, um, as being like, hey, look, this is like the key motorsport now because Porsche and Audi have spent a long time in WEC and doing Le Mans and all that kind of stuff. And they've just like, it's good for within racing circles, but it doesn't have like the broad appeal of Formula One, which, which Formula One has built on now, which I thought was really interesting. And then the second really interesting thing as well, which was he's like, you know, I'm speaking to, you know, our, our powertrains teams here and they all tell me that, you know, it's really difficult to make like quick gains. No, it's really easy to make quick gains in Formula One, but you have to have lots of Formula One experience, like five to 10 years of like a team on the grid, which just immediately you're like, oh, cool. So you're going to buy a team and then stick an Audi powertrain in it and call it the Porsche F1 team or some mixture of those things, or maybe have two teams. I don't know. Um to go up against like kind of the Mercedes like, from the car manufacturing perspective behemoth. But I, I wonder then, Rod, who might they be looking at buying? And I wonder if there's any teams that are kind of maybe primed themselves for sale over the next couple of years or so. What do you think of the news overall and who do you think they might buy? I mean, the question is, who is up for sale? I mean, you'd have to think that maybe Williams might be there if they don't get any, any you know, further up the grid. Mm. People who just recently bought them might be like, oh boy. We didn't realize what we bought. Maybe we can, uh, we can, you know, on gift, gift this on, uh, and yeah. sell this on to some other sucker. I mean, some other investor. But, uh, who else would be up for sale? I don't even know. I mean, Haas, who knows? Um, yeah, maybe Haas. There's also, Haas is a good chat. It's also, I mean, they say that it, they, they maybe would prefer not to set up their other team, but there are other people that want to set up their own teams, and Christian Horn is not very happy about it. So, uh, with other, other teams joining the grid, I think it would be a really good option to buy a team because you will already have someone else definitely who's going to be behind you. you may not even have a car that starts when they're, <laughs> they're building everything from scratch with cars yeah. that are stuck together with like tape and bubble gum and stuff. So it'd be <laughs> very advantageous. And then you get the jump on them uh, the following year because you'll get extra prize money and all the rest of it. So yeah, I think buying yeah. one definitely makes sense. It always has made sense. It just always has. You can see the yeah, struggles that Haas had, do. even though, yeah, I mean, Haas sort of hit the ground running when they came in by going, oh, it's sort of a Ferrari, but not really. But they also still really struggled. People forget that. So uh, yeah. they might have had an explosive arrival to Formula One, but it was still pretty tough for a while. So I st- I've always felt after that that, yeah, it's clear buying a team is the way to go, if you can buy one, if there is one. Yeah, I wonder about that because I'm looking around at the teams. I'm like, oh, but you've got a Mercedes powertrain. It's like, no, they've all got powertrains from someone else. That's yeah. someone else. That's the whole point. So, I yeah, I think Haas <laughs> is a good shout. I think Aston Martin's a good shout as well. And I also think maybe Alfa Tori, um, if they wanted to break off into their own If they thing. wanted to. They're um, selling so many pairs of shorts and whatever the hell they're selling. That's true. Know. Yeah. Uh, waterproof jackets, I think, is what they yes. specialize in, like tech wear. Um, so, yeah. Anyway. I'm excited for that because I love Porsche uh, and they've got both those teams have really good racing history and I look forward to Mark Webber team principal. Look forward to that in 2026. Between now and then, do you want to do a super quiz? Yes. We will accept a couple of questions. Should one only win one? Would one want to have won that one in round one? Can you repeat the question? <laughs> Zach, we have done so many, like hundreds of quizzes, right? We've done everything under the sun. But then I realized with seeing the side of that fake harbor in, in the Miami Grand Prix uh, facility made me realize we've never done an F1 boat quiz. So this is the I'm on a boat quiz, a Formula One boat adjacent aquatic themed quiz. You ready? 
I just do want to say I had yeah, we left it out of the notes. Neither of us had mentioned the marina up until this point, and it was well, the <laughs> biggest talk of the town. I had wondered uh, if it was going to come off at all, and you got it in there. I'm proud of you. So I, number one, fucking stupid. Get rid of that. That is shit. Get rid of that fucking. But crown. it's so American. And all It'll the cringy about stuff Las about Vegas. getting the police to drive Max Verstappen to the podium, and it took longer for him to do that oh. than like the other two were just sitting there waiting for his arrival. Fucking stupid. Mate, Get rid of all that. I can guarantee. Shit. Anyway, at, at Vegas, it's going to be like they'll have stuff littered around the track that's like calling out like yeah, that. <laughs> in, like, like historical F one things, and like oh, it's going to be the worst, but also the kind of good. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. Hit me with oh, the quiz. Anyway, here we go. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six questions for you. Question the number the one. The most famous example of an F one driver interacting with a boat is Kimi Raikkonen who left the track after retiring to sink a few beers in his hot tub. We all know it was at the Monaco Grand Prix, Zach, but what year was it? Oh, bloody hell. Um, I'm pretty sure it was with McLaren at that stage. So I reckon is that like 2009? Something like that? Well, he wasn't at McLaren in 2009, but also oh. it was 2006. Ah, so a little bit, I couldn't a little remember bit. which side of the... Hmm. Which side of... Yeah, no, in that in that decade, which is actually pretty good because it was a long time ago now. Yeah. Question the number the two former F1 drivers, Eddie Irvine, Jensen Button, and David Coulthard, they all own yachts. Uh, I can tell you that the three yachts in question are 45 foot, 72 foot, and 90 foot, but I want you to tell me in order by the driver's name, which boat is the smallest to largest? <laughs> So you said it was Irvine, Coulthard, and Button, and right? Button, yep. Yep. So I think uh, Buttons is the smallest, then Coulthard in the middle, and then Irvine at the top end. Oh, you're really close. Coulthard's smallest, 45 foot. I say small, 45 foot yacht's pretty big. Mm-hmm. Button, 72 foot, and then Eddie Irvine coming in big in the clutch always with the 90 biggest. footer. Yeah, like, I guess always, so. Like, as soon, well, as, you the time, as, soon as you said the names, I was like, there we go. Because it just, he, it used to be a really big signifier of like how big of a douche, I mean, how rich and cool you were <laughs> to have a bigger yacht. But now, now it means nothing. Now we've all got 100 foot yachts and it doesn't mean anything. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, the largest yacht that was in the harbour for last year's Monaco Grand Prix, Zach, was a mammoth 316-foot super yacht called Faith. I want you to tell me how much it cost. A, $20 million. B, $200 million. Or C, $2 billion. I think it's $200 million. Ding, ding, ding. $2 million. Yeah. Congratulations. How did you know that? $200 million, right? Yeah, yeah, $200 million. Yeah. That's what you said. Um, that was the answer. Okay. Yes. So, uh, the reason I know that. I I'm a bit of a yacht sure. guy. That's how much I'm a my bit of a yacht, yacht guy. costs. So no, that's how I, mean, I know. Uh, I go on holidays and sometimes <laughs> you go to places where the You've yachts are. So, no, Malta is really the place, actually. A Ooh. lot of these yachts are registered in Valletta, the port of Valletta in Malta. Um, that's mm. actually where I saw, um, who was the guy who used to own Force India? Um, um, <laughs> PJ Malia? PJ Malia, I saw his boat there. Um, his boat, it's a fucking ship. Um, and so, yeah. His city I, I, on the ocean. I've been on a few boat cruises around a few places. I've been to Monaco a few times too. When you see the really big ones, you look them up on the internet. And uh, of you course. you can find where they're registered and how much they cost to build and <laughs> how much they were sold for and how many staff they have and all the features mm. they have and all that kind of stuff, which is actually very, very, yeah. very interesting. So, yes, I, I mm. didn't know how much that was. Someone oh, yeah, boy, I found some... <laughs> I found some websites that are just just a website that's just like here's every every yacht and how much it costs and who mm. owns it. Uh, so yeah. obviously that's a whole thing. Um, well, yeah, you're doing you did pretty well. You won out of three so far, so you're definitely on track to <laughs> suck. Um, I'm the no, color no, signs of super quiz. <laughs> now that you've added yourself as the yacht guy, you're gonna you're gonna smash all the rest. A few months ago, Fernando Alonso joined the club and he got in the act of buying his first ever yacht. What was unique about it and what convinced him to pony up and finally get a yacht? Oh, what was unique about it? Why did he finally get it? Um, maybe it was like one of a kind and it used to be owned by, I don't know, some famous footballer, something like that. I don't know. No, That's I'm my sorry. answer. One it of was, a kind uh, and it was owned by a footballer. 
<laughs> the thing that he liked about it was that it was an electric yacht. I didn't even know oh. you could have an electric yacht. I guess it runs on electric cool. wind in its electric sails or something. A 60 sunroof power echo, if you want to Google that one. Uh, that's what oh. Fernando Alonso just picked himself up recently, just a couple of months ago. Wow. Well, come over um, to you and come over to him. Mm-mm. Speaking of websites, according to LuxuryF1.com, you can book a Monaco GP package deal where you spend the weekend aboard a luxury yacht if you want to enjoy the race for a weekend. What do you reckon it would set you back, Zach? I'm going to just let you, let, you, let you pull a number and I'll give you one point for every euro that you are within. I think it's 14,000 euros. Mm, nearly double it. That's 26,000 euros 26, just for a weekend Ooh. on board a yacht. You don't get to keep the yacht. You don't even get to keep the hat. No. You don't get anything. No, no, You no. just get to go home back to your, you know, your smaller boat, I your remember, modest boat. I pulled that number and that number's a little old now, I think, because I remember years ago oh, that's probably looking it, yeah. up what it would cost to get a weekend on one of the yachts parked in Monaco. Not for my mm. own personal use. I think I was looking it up for maybe a quiz or just wanted to see if it was cheaper, if you could get like 10 people organized, how much it might cost. Sure, right. Or like yeah. 30 people. Um, There's probably different yachts too. Yeah, and I worked out that ex-North Melbourne football player, Glenn Archer, and a couple of other sports people run like a, a sports like, tours company. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's one of the things they do. Like they'll hire, huh. you can hire a luxury Formula One yacht experience through them. And I think that was about 15 <laughs> grand. So I forgot to put inflation on top and, and the emerging... Uh, wealth classes of other countries who would probably want to do that. But ooh, mm. I don't know, 26,000 euros. That's Yeah, you're Mr. Euros. Can you that? do a conversion for us? To dollars. Uh, what would it be like? About pounds, 45 grand? $45,000? Mm. Something like that. Oh, wait. Yeah. That's more than I've got on yeah. me. Yeah, um, same. Well, I mean, you know all about the cost of yachts. You know about where they're like often registered and moored and so on. The last question will be right up your alley. Lastly, there is one notable Formula One driver who owns a yacht that's 90 foot long. It costs $4 million. It's usually either docked in Monaco, where this driver lives, or the rest of the time it's in Nice. Zach, can you tell me who the mystery owner of this yacht is? Usually parked in Monaco where they live, or it's also parked in Nice. Current F1 driver, you said? Current. Mm. I'm going to say it is, is it Lewis Hamilton? Yes, Louis Hamilton. I knew you'd know this one. Yeah, yeah. He seems like a yacht guy. I can get behind a yacht. You know, I'd mm-hmm. want to get in a yacht. I, if I had that kind of money, I think I would buy a yacht. But like like Alonso, one of the electric ones. Mm, yeah, I, I like that too, because you get to brag about it. Like that's a, that's a big flex, right? Um, yeah. would you, would you pick, if you had to pick between yacht and private plane, I was going to say how yachts are like the jets of, of the, of the waters. Hmm. Well, well, of course, a lot of, you some drivers have their own jets. I'd, I'd go jet. Yeah. I mean, it's not as fun though. I think a yacht, like mm, no, the tr- like the journey is the, the fun too. But I mean, the, no, I, know uh, mean. I mean, the thing is, if you want to get somewhere, I'd go jet. If you just wanted to sit. And, and enjoy the journey more than yacht. You know what I mean? Because you could just sit in yeah. open waters and be like, this is amazing. I've never really been in a plane up in the sky and be like, I just want to stay up here for all, I just want to stay up here all day. Uh, a bit better for the environment too. Probably you just turn off the, the boat engine and you're done flying around in a jet. Not so great as I understand Not it. Not so great. Maybe yeah, it's think, an electric jet. The fact that it's a little bit like a house as well. It's like the caravan of the seas. You just kind of, you can turn <laughs> off at a place and be like, well, they don't even have to dock anywhere. Like we can just sit here in this shallow water and I can jump off and swim. But also I've got like staff who will go and like cook me food and all that kind of thing. I like, I like that. The movable little hotel. I guess you're right. Anyway. I mean, it also depends whether you get Wi-Fi. So that's the other. Yeah. That's the yeah. Other, yeah you get that factor. Starlink or whatever from, from Moscow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's exactly right. Um, well, look, I mean, look, I, I forget the score. I think you aced it. You did very well. Probably like 100%, the, uh, probably, I would say. Mm-hmm, around there. You're 100 adjacent. So that's the super quiz done for this week. I guess we'll do another one in future. And I guess we could maybe work out when the next one's going to be. You've got, you've got some big uh, social okay. engagements on your on your horizon. So I don't know. Yeah. But we've got, I thought... Um... Spain coming up, and then we mm-hmm. got uh, Monaco. Monaco. I think we'll probably do one between Monaco and Azerbaijan. So similar time yeah. again next month, probably in that first week of June, we'll reflect on yeah. uh, on Spain and Monaco. I'm getting married somewhere in there, so um, I, <laughs> I didn't know if you wanted that. to let that out or not. But yeah, yeah, um, I'm going to be married. Man. 
fans. Yeah. So, you know, um, <laughs> it's all it's all happening for me. Um, so, yeah, I think probably the week of this, the 6th of June, we'll probably pop something out around then, I reckon. Beautiful. Before we move into a double header week, and we've got Azerbaijan and Canada back to back. So, it's yeah. Double race week. Yeah. Maybe some drive to survive between now and then. If you're I was going to say, you can look for that. We've we've, we've opened our account. We've got one in the bag, so we'll can, we'll continue dare to swear, but uh, we'll work out around your other things that you have to do. How are we going to do that? Maybe we'll bank one or two or something. I don't know. But again, yeah. rest assured, if you're a member of the Patreon, you get the episodes early, so you get the dare to swear early. And obviously, when we're recording these episodes, we just record them and drop the raw feed straight into the the patreon for you to enjoy you don't have to wait that extra day two days sometimes uh, for us to get the episodes out so it always pays to get into the patreon and enjoy that extra content get extra early but other than that uh, if you wanted to send us anything you can follow us on twitter we're at super license you can send us an email at super license podcast at gmail.com or visit the website super license.fm zach the fm stands for formula men Mm -mm. get around Mm -mm. it don't forget um, yeah, I think that's it. I'll jump in the Discord if you like. There's some good Discord yeah. chat this week, especially around the race stuff. And it's all, if you're worried about spoilers too, I was going to point this out. We have a race chat section of the Discord. So if you just want to sit in the general Discord but not get the race spoiled for you, we all the race chat happens in the race chat channel. So you won't, you won't get it spoiled. Exactly. Uh, I think it's a good thing. Exactly. I had the race spoiled for me. I, I had the podium spoiled ah. for me, which, which made those last few laps maybe less exciting. Um, so because, you know, like they were like, is Leclerc going to catch Verstappen? I'm like, no, he's not. No, I know he's not. But I, I did do very well in fantasy, so I'm not complaining. God, mm. I predicted, here's what I predicted, the podium. I predicted yeah. pole. I predicted uh, the, the bonus question, I think, was asked, where are Aston Martin going to finish? I'm pretty sure I got that one. Nice. I said there would be two safety cars, but there's only one. But other than that, yeah. and my team magically just did really well. I was top 12 this week. Okay. So, can't well, complain about that. I reckon. I reckon next next episode we'll do a little bit of a we'll do a fantasy roundup too. A good time everybody. to do a roundup. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Good call. Good call. Good call. Nice. GG. GG. Cool. Um, GG. Well, yeah. Everybody, make uh, those smart changes so that you have a better chance of us calling out your name uh, next time we do the fantasy roundup. Other than that, Zach, any other thing else you want to bring no. to the table? That's it. Beautiful. Well, I guess I'll talk to you soon for Dare to Swear, and then we'll be back with more race talk in a few weeks. And until then, keep watching all the races. My name's been Rodney. My name's been Zach. Catch you on the flip side. Bye-bye. Bye. Yeah.